Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Welcome to our uh, BakerBots Corporate Series presentation. Today we're going to be talking about the UPC structure and related issues. I'm A.J. Erickson. I'm a corporate partner in the Houston office, and uh, presenting with me today is my partner, Steve Marcus, from, from our Dallas office, who's a tax specialist. Uh, if you have questions, we're, we're going to try and save those for the end of the program, but if, if during the program a question occurs to you, you can email that to Marissa McDonald. That's Marissa, one R, two S's, dot McDonald, M-C-D-O-N-A-L-D, at bakerbots.com. Her email address should also be on the invitation that you received. Uh, this program has been approved for one hour of Texas and California CLE credit, participatory credit, and for New York CLE credit, one hour professional practice tran transitional and non-transitional. Later in the program, we will provide a CLE number. Please write that down. We'll read it a couple of times. You'll need to include that in the affirmation form uh, that was included in the link to or that was linked in the invitation for the reminder that you got yesterday. You'll need to add that number to the form to get CLE credit. If you didn't receive the invitation or, or need an affirmation form, you can also email Marissa for that. Again, marissa1r2s.mcdonald at bakerbots.com. A recording of this webinar will be circulated in the next week and will also be posted on our firm website, bakerbots.com. So we'll start out by giving an overview of the UPC structure. So I guess it, it, as background, we'll, we'll contrast this to the, to the traditional corporate structure. So in a traditional corporate structure, the chart looks a lot like what, what you see here, but we're gonna, we would ignore the triangle. The pre-IPO investors, uh, the founders or sponsors, and the public shareholders would split their economics in a, in a traditional C-corp they, they just all have the same class of shares, uh, you know, setting aside situations that you sometimes see in tech, where in tech where you'd have a super voting share or something. But they're all getting their economics, and, and they all exercise their voting power through the public company, Pubco, the red box. So the UPC, the UPC is a little bit different. Um, the UPC keeps the operations all, all in OPCO, the triangle at, at the bottom of the box. And that's the only asset or interest in this OPCO. That's the only asset and the only cash generation that PubCo has. Um, PubCo will control, will control OPCO through either a GP or a managing member interest so that it remains in the driver's seat. But then uh, there are tax benefits for the sponsors or founders who are able to hold their economics in interest in OPCO directly through, through a class of OPCO units, and then we'll pair each OPCO unit with a non-economic voting share in PubCo. So you see that split in, in the chart. Um, if, for, say for example, a third of, of the interest in the company is sold to the public, that's, that's what the public shareholders would have through this Class A box. And then all of the economics, the two-thirds of the economics of the, of the founders comes through this line on the far left, but their two-thirds voting power goes through their Class B shares in, in PubCo. This is a, a structure that's become broadly accepted by the marketplace. Um, 45 plus UPC IPOs in the last 12 years. You see it in 20, 2014, which was really a peak year for IPO activity. There were 15. That's the, the that was the most UPC IPOs in any year, and it's been about five to six percent of IPOs in the 2012 to 2015 period. We've listed some examples both in the energy space as well as the non-energy space. And you see some, some well-recognized names there. Um, uh, so plenty, plenty of acceptance for this product in the marketplace. 
we'll talk now about what are some of the benefits. We'll, we'll split this out between benefits for the, the sponsors or founders, the existing owners of the company, and then we'll talk about some of the other benefits that inure to, to PubCo from this structure. So first off, in this setup, the sponsors still remain control, um, will re remain control over the operations, assuming that they continue to, to own a majority of, of the voting power in, in PubCo. Um, through their control over PubCo, they will also retain control over the, operate, the operations of the company that are in OPCO. Uh, just something to mention as well is that although for tax purposes PubCo is a C-Corp, it doesn't necessarily need to be a state law corporation to, to do that. And there are examples um, where the PubCo is an LLC or an LP. For example, the Tallgrass GPIPO was set up as a partnership, but it's a corporation for tax purposes. That allows, notwithstanding what the what their economic ownership is in, in the overall structure, that allows the through a general partner ownership that allows the sponsors to retain control at any any ownership level. So it makes that control absolute. Um, AJ had mentioned earlier that uh, one one of the benefits for sponsor founders uh, in an up C structure uh, are, are some nice tax benefits. Uh, the, those benefits consist of a uh, single level of taxation on income earned uh, by OPCO. That income passes through to the sponsor founders and is taxed just once. Uh, by contrast, uh, uh, any income earned through a C corporation is taxed at the C corporation level. Then the distribution is taxed as a dividend to the uh, shareholder. Uh, another nice tax benefit for the uh, sponsors or founders is the uh, pass-through of any losses generated by OPCO. Um, subject to passive activity loss rules, uh, those losses potentially can be used to offset other income that the uh, sponsor or founders have from other sources. Another nice uh, benefit is that notwithstanding the fact that the uh, sponsors own units in OPCO, which is a privately held company, those units effectively provide liquidity. And that's because the uh, sponsors have exchange rights that allow them to exchange an LP unit in OPCO or an LLC unit in OPCO for a share of common stock, Class A common stock of PubCo at any time. Those exchanges are taxable to the uh, exchanging unit holder. Uh, that sounds like it might be an issue, it really isn't, because generally a uh, unit holder is only going to make an exchange if, as, and when the unit holder desires a liquidity event and in turn will sell the uh, PubCo stock that it just received as a result of the exchange. In order to uh, facilitate the liquidity, uh, typically the PubCo is going to be required to have a registration statement in effect that permits the exchanging unit holder to sell the PubCo Class A common shares that the uh, unit holder receives in the exchange without having uh, to uh, worry about the uh, Rule 144 holding period. A, another nice tax feature for an up structure that, uh, that potentially benefits sponsor founders is that uh, it, in connection with an IPO, there may be ways for the sponsor to uh, extract cash uh, without having to pay tax or uh, alternatively uh, with paying tax on only part of the cash that they get. In particular, in the case of a partnership, um, you can sometimes avoid disguise sale rules by having PubCo contribute cash to OPCO. OPCO then turns around and distributes the cash out to the uh, sponsor. If that distribution represents a reimbursement of capital expenditures that the sponsors made within the prior 24 months, part or all of that distribution might be uh, tax deferred. That, that particular exception is subject to some limitations, but uh, gener generally it, it provides for some tax deferral. There's also a, an exception in the case of uh, distributions from a partnership where the distribution is debt financed 
uh, that, that may cause part of the distribution to also be tax deferred. By contrast, in a typical uh, C corporation IPO, a, a sponsor is simply going to sell their shares in, in the IPO, and that's going to be a fully taxable sale by the sponsor. So now we'll, now we'll flip it around and we'll look at, at some of the benefits to this structure from the perspective of uh, from the perspective of, of the public company. So, one and, and, and maybe. Maybe benefit isn't the right word, but but just something notable that it's not a detriment is that in this structure, even though you have this class of, of sponsors or founders who own a significant economic interest in in the holding company below that houses all of your operations, you're able to do that without giving up any control that that the pubco has over over this opco. You do that through a general partner interest or a managing member interest, but, but then PubCo re remains in the driver's seat. That, that's also important uh, when you think about accounting for, for all of these operations that, that through that control, regardless of what the, uh, what the actual economic interest that PubCo has in OPCO, OPCO is able to consolidate the operator, or PubCo consolidates the operations of OPCO for, for financial statements purposes. So, some other benefits to the uh, PubCo of an UPC structure are uh, merger and acquisition benefits. And in, in particular, having both a PubCo that's a C corporation and an OPCO that's a uh, partnership for tax purposes provides from, uh, some flexibility uh, on acquisitions that uh, produce a, a better tax result than simply having a C corporation. In cases where you have a target company that owns assets or a target company that itself is an LLC or a partnership, the uh, seller can actually contribute either the equity in the uh, LLC or partnership or the assets to OPCO, receive OPCO units in exchange for that contribution, and that transaction would be tax-free to the uh, seller. Conversely, if uh, a, a seller tried to contribute assets or uh, interest in a pass-through entity to a C corporation, the receipt of C corporation stock would generally be taxable to the seller. So having OPCO in the UPC structure pr provides a tax benefit in that situation. In, in cases where uh, the target is itself a C corporation, the uh, target can simply merge with or into PubCo or a subsidiary of PubCo in a tax-free transaction with the shareholders of the Target C Corporation receiving PubCo stock. In that case, there, there would be one additional step you'd have to take, and that would be uh, you, you would need to have PubCo drop down the business it just acquired into OPCO in exchange for OPCO units. That, as we'll discuss later, is going to be necessary in order to preserve the one-for-one uh, -one exchange ratio of OPCO units for PubCo Class A stock. If uh, PubCo is a target company, or OPCO is a target company, having an UPC structure also provides a potential benefit for, for an acquirer. In, in particular, an acquirer could acquire the units of uh, OPCO that are owned by the sponsors and founders in a taxable acquisition and obtain a tax basis step up, or at least a partial tax basis step up in uh, OPCO's assets. As a result of that basis step up, at least hypothetically, a, an acquirer should be willing to pay more for the uh, assets that OPCO owns. Conversely, if uh, you're talking about a typical C corporation, it generally is not going to be tax uh, advantageous to try to structure a taxable asset sale because it would be subject to two levels of taxation. In other words, in order to give the buyer a basis step up when a buyer is acquiring a business from a C corporation, the uh, C corporation has to pay tax at the corporate level, and the uh, shareholders have to pay tax if the C corporation liquidates or makes a distribution. In, in cases where the uh, acquirer is, a, is a, a C corporation, but you want to attempt to uh, obtain tax deferral for the uh, sponsors and founders, 
Uh, we have seen structures where the acquirer itself sets up an UPC structure. The uh, sponsor founders of the uh, target UPC that, uh, that, that own units in OPCO will swap their OPCO units for units uh, in the acquirer's UPC operating partnership or operating LLC. And that constitutes a tax deferred transaction for the uh, sponsors. Yeah, and I think one of the one of the themes that that runs through the, these various benefits that that we've talked about about so far is that it's providing an, an additional layer of flexibility in how you might structure your transactions. Another area where where you've got more flexibility by virtue of this OPC structure is you have some additional options that are available to you for your equity compensation program. In a in a traditional C corp. Uh, your, in, your equity compensation program is, is going to be things like qualified stock options, incentive stock options, restricted stock. Um, but you have the opportunity via OPCO to offer profits interest to, to your employees that are, that are directly, uh, their interest in OPCO rather than the PUBCO, so that, that allows you to provide some tax advantaged equity compensation to, to your, your key people. Um, which, which, which can be an, an attractive, an attractive option, but um, you wouldn't have that in, in, in traditional structures. Yeah, just what, one point on the uh, OPCO profits interests. Um, that, that is an attractive feature because a, a recipient of a profits interest generally doesn't pay any tax at all upon uh, receipt or, or vesting of profits interests. They only pay taxes. Opco passes through operating income, and ultimately, when they exit, hopefully, they get a capital gain. Uh, one one feature of an up C that puts a little bit of a restriction on the profits interest is the uh, exchange feature, for, uh, whereby Opco units can be exchanged for Class A shares. Um, you probably don't want to have a profits interest that is exchanged for. Uh, PUBCO shares within a couple of years after it's initially issued. Uh, the IRS have a, has a revenue procedure that essentially says that uh, if you issue a profits interest and it's transferred within two years, the profits interest no longer qualifies for safe harbor treatment as a qualifying profits interest. So that, that's one thing to watch out for when you are setting up a profits interest at, at the OPCO level in an UPC structure. Um, so, some other benefits to uh, PubCo, and this is probably one of the biggest ones, is the uh, a basis step up that PubCo gets in its share of OPCO assets. Every time an OPCO unit holder exchanges its OPCO units for PubCo Class A stock. The reason that basis step up occurs is because, uh, as mentioned earlier, an exchange of OPCO units for PubCo stock is actually treated as a taxable exchange for, for tax purposes. As a result, PubCo is treated as having purchased those units in a taxable purchase, provided that a 754 election is in effect for OPCO, PubCo gets a tax basis step up in its share of uh, the tax basis in OPCO's assets. That tax basis step up produces future tax benefits to PubCo through additional depreciation, amortization, or depletion deductions for PubCo. Those deductions in turn re reduce future taxable income that PubCo realizes from its investment in OPCO. And as a result, reduces uh, PubCo's uh, future tax liabilities. So that's a pretty nice tax benefit from the UPC structure. Simple example to kind of illustrate that tax benefit. Um, Let's say we have an OPCO unit holder who has a tax basis of $10 million in his uh, OPCO units. Those OPCO units are worth $100 million. The OPCO unit holder exchanges those units for Class A shares of PUBCO. Assume further that any basis step up resulting from that exchange would be allocated to 15-year assets like goodwill or going concern value and that the uh, applicable tax rate for PubCo is 40%. In that case, 
the exchange would result in a basis step up to PUBCO in its share of OPCO's assets of $90 million. That basis step up would provide PUBCO with additional amortization deductions of $6 million each year for the next 15 years. If PUBCO has sufficient taxable income so that it could fully utilize those deductions, PUBCO would realize a tax savings each year of about $2.4 million for each of the next 15 years. The end result is PUBCO ends up uh, saving taxes totaling $36 million over the 15-year period. Even though under tax law that, that uh, benefit is solely PUBCO's tax benefit, in, uh, in most UPC structures, a tax receivable agreement is put in place so that essentially PUBCO pays the exchanging unit holder for a portion of that tax benefit. In other words, PUBCO shares the tax benefit with the exchanging unit holder by paying the exchanging unit holder as uh, PUBCO actually realizes the tax benefit. Under typical tax receivable agreements, uh, the sharing ratio is essentially 85% to the exchanging unit holder and 15% to PUBCO. Uh, that, that varies on occasion, but 85-15 is generally kind of what's market currently. The uh, timing of those payments generally are PUBCO only makes the payments if, as, and when it actually realizes cash tax savings as a result of the uh, basis step up and the use of the additional depreciation and amortization deductions that we described on the prior slide. The uh, actual tax benefit, though, is really consists of two parts. The first part is what we illustrated on the prior slide, which is the uh, basis step up resulting from the exchange itself. In other words, the delta between the uh, value of the Class A stock that uh, PUBCO issues to the exchanging unit holder and the unit holder's basis in the unit. That's kind of the part one of the benefit. There's an additional tax benefit, though, that arises because of the tax receivable agreement itself. In particular, each payment that's made under the tax receivable agreement is treated as additional purchase price that PUBCO is paying to the exchanging unit holder for those uh, units that were previously exchanged. That additional purchase price, in turn, creates an additional tax basis step up for uh, PUBCO that it can then amortize and obtain additional deductions for. On top of that, a portion of each payment is treated under applicable tax rules as an imputed interest deduction for PUBCO, which also generates a deduction and potentially reduces PUBCO's taxable income. The uh, then result of all this is a pretty sizable benefit to sponsors and founders. Uh, a 2011 PricewaterhouseCoopers report estimated that a UPC structure with a tax receivable agreement with the features we just described can result in sponsors realizing up to an additional 30 to 40 percent of total value as compared to a traditional IPO structure without a tax receivable agreement. Um, we, we mentioned kind of in the prior slide I had mentioned sort of the basic tax benefit that a tax receivable agreement covers, which is the basis step up from the exchange itself, plus any additional basis resulting from TRA payments. Some of the newer tax receivable agreements, and certainly tax receivable agreements that we see outside of the UPC structure, sometimes cover additional tax benefits, which provide an even greater benefit to the sponsors. Uh, these benefits can sometimes include tax basis that's already held by OPCO and its assets that results from uh, transaction, acquisition transactions that OPCO might have engaged in in the few years prior to the IPO. Uh, tax receivable agreements often also include uh, uh, payments for tax benefits resulting from net operating losses that PUBCO inherits if a blocker corporation merges into PUBCO as part of the IPO. 
Um, let, let me explain that one a little bit. Uh, oftentimes, sponsors are private equity funds in, in these uh, upsea structures. Those private equity funds typically have foreign investors and tax-exempt investors in them that invest through the various investments held by the private equity fund through a blocker corporation. That's needed so that the foreign investor can avoid being engaged in a U.S. trade or business and having effectively connected income and so that a tax-exempt investor can avoid having uh, unrelated business taxable income. Typically, when you uh, form a uh, up-C structure pursuant to an IPO, the blocker corporation is going to merge into PubCo, and those tax-exempt and foreign investors will receive stock of PubCo. And that merger will be tax-free in most cases, but the, uh, as a result of the merger, PubCo may very well succeed to NOLs and other tax attributes of the blocker corporation. Tax receivable agreements oftentimes try to capture some of those tax benefits. A few other tax benefits that, that we've seen in some of the more recent receivable agreements are uh, amortization deductions for debt issuance costs for debt that was incurred to finance pre-IPO acquisitions by OPCO. Also, uh, tax benefits arising from deductions for costs and expenses incurred in connection with IPO transactions or recent acquisition transactions are sometimes captured as tax benefits under the uh, tax receivable agreement. The uh, taxes that we're talking about always include federal income taxes. Typically, they include state income taxes. If the uh, uh, PubCo and OPCO actually operate in foreign jurisdictions. They may very well also, also include foreign tax savings resulting from asset basis. Another feature of, of, of tax receivable agreements that we want to talk about are, are, are the early termination provisions. It's often the case that these agreements will, will provide for an acceler acceleration of, of the potential payments that are due by PubCo in the event of uh, specified change of control transactions or upon early termination of the tax receivable agreement or, or uh, breaches of the agreement by PubCo, um, that, 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 that payment can be a tricky thing um, because it requires there to be a, a lot of assumptions uh, made. Off. You're, you're taking out all these payments that would have been made over time. You're making them all at, all at once, and so you have different assumptions that include that an, an assumption that unit holders would have immediately exchanged their OPCO units. Um, you're also assuming that that there would be sufficient taxable income for that would enable PubCo to utilize all those tax benefits resulting from 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 the exchange. So you've you've got a potential situation where uh, you're you're assuming that the tax benefit is X and making a payment today based on that assumed benefit, but there's no guarantee that that PubCo would ultimately realize those benefits down down the road. Um, you know, uh, Steve mentioned the, the potential the potential value over time is could be 30 to 40 percent of additional consideration compared to the I, the traditional IPO. So you're talking about a potentially very, very large payment that can be that can be triggered. Um, some might describe this, or it has the potential to be like a like a poison pill. Even you've got a transaction, and a a, a very significant portion of the value is immediately leaking out through this accelerated payment to to the sponsors. Um, and I, I think really the the main takeaways on this point are that when you're investing in the structure, that's something that, that you need to be aware of. And there'll be a there'll be plenty of risk factor and other disclosures around these potential potential payments in any any prospectus um, for investors. But I think the other another thing to think about is when you're in an M&A transaction that involves stock, regardless of which side of the transaction you're on. I, that these change of control and, and acceleration provisions are ones that require careful attention. 
the way the way you have a, a change of control definition typically drafted, um, you know, refer to ownership by groups and 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 specified thresholds. And as you as you step back and think about those particular definitions as applied to to your transaction, and, and each of these each of these ones is written a little bit differently. And I don't know that there is perfect a perfect way to write it, but there are ones that require thought because as you look at it, you can see potential ways that that, that might be gamed by someone to, to trigger an early payment. So it's a conversation that you would need to have with, with the counterparties um, and, and potentially you even want to have a have a side letter or some amendment in connection with your transaction to make sure that uh, it's that it's treated for purposes of, uh, or that it's treated under the agreement the way the parties, both parties to the transaction would expect. Yeah, there's one other piece of that. Uh, AJ had mentioned that the early termination uh, provisions can occur in connection with a change of control. Uh, they also occur in connection with uh, breaches and differing tax receivable agreements will have Differing levels of what constitutes a material enough breach to trigger a change of control. Um, some typical ones would, would include a rejection in bankruptcy. Uh, some of them e even include a, a failure to make uh, payments on time under the TRA. Typically, there's going to be a grace period of some sort before that type of a breach triggers acceleration. Uh, some of them are a little more lenient on failures to make payments. There may be breaches resulting from uh, any sort of uh, uh, default under any credit agreement, not just under a TRA. Uh, if the uh, PubCo or OpCo defaults under any of its other credit agreements, that could be considered a breach under the TRA. So you, you kind of need to read those provisions carefully to see uh, how much of a hair trigger breach may really be on these early termination payments. A few other restrictions uh, that we typically see. Um, AJ, do you want to cover those? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, what, one that you may see are restrictions against the, the PubCo or OpCo incurring other debt, um, other than subordinated debt, and you know, that gets to the point that we were just talking about uh, on the breaches. You're, uh, you you would expect that that. Uh, the sponsor is attributing a lot of value to the tax receivable agreement and, and, and its ability to, to receive payments and benefits under that agreement, and so uh, you, you, you want to protect against becoming over leveraged, and, and uh, that, that potentially uh, precluding you from realizing those benefits that, that you're expecting. Um, there also could be restrictions against uh, tax gross-ups on withholdings for TR. TRA payments if the PubCo becomes a foreign corporation, and then there are the accelerate, acceleration for other credit, credit events that Steve has just talked about. Um, another, another thing that, that, that's just interesting to note, but you, you could have a situation where the PubCo has made an overpayment under the TRA because there, it can be difficult to calculate what that specific benefit is. or, or uh, there, there could be a benefit that's the basis of a TRA payment that the, the IRS or other taxing authority ultimately disallows. The typical way that that would be treated under the agreement is there's no clawback uh, of that payment made based on that, that tax benefit. It's just something that's uh, held on the books and used to offset future, future, uh, future TRA payments so you could have some timing issues. Um, I'd mentioned before that there'll be lots of disclosure around these agreements in in any prospectus for for an UPSI. Some of the typical items that you'll see disclosures about are the the current and the maximum future potential liability that PubCo has under the TRA. Um, you'll have a discussion both of what the early termination provisions are, as well as the impact that that, that could have um, on possible future transactions that that PubCo or OpCo might undertake in the same way you'd see uh, risk factor disclosure about any, any anti-takeover provisions in, in PubCo's charter. 
um, as you, you might also see disclosure about uh, any of the debt and currents restrictions that we've talked about and how, how, how both that as well as payments that are going to be made under the TRA might have an impact on OPCO, on PUBCO or OPCO and their ability to obtain financing going forward. Um, so we've, we go, we've, we've just gone through a list of or, or a lot of the considerations around this tax receivable agreement and you say, that's a lot of cash coming out the door. Um, what we understand from, from talking with investment bankers is, is notwithstanding these large potential payments, that uh, there, there really isn't a, a, a material adverse effect on, on, on the IPO valuations or, as you saw in that second slide, or the, the market acceptance of this product. And I think some of that is, is just uh, a question of how much investors value these tax benefits anyway. And I think, I think another part of it is even though you've got this sharing of tax benefits, it's a sharing of a benefit that wouldn't have existed to be shared but for this structure anyway. If, if, if you have a, a company in the energy space, you know, one question you might ask is, well, I, I could probably do that as an MLP or, or an UPC. Why, why would I consider an UPC instead of an MLP if I'm talking about an energy company? Um, one, uh, and these are kind of a few tax reasons why an UPC may be more desirable than an MLP. Um, one thing is, even though it is an energy company, uh, if you're an MLP, you have to keep careful track of whether or not you're uh, meeting the requirement that at least 90% of your gross income constitutes income from certain qualifying passive sources. Uh, those, those generally include interest, dividends, rent from unrelated parties, and then the, the big one, income from uh, producing, processing, refining, transporting, or storing oil or gas or products thereof or other natural resources. Um, notwithstanding the fact that energy companies typically can meet that requirement, it does require a fair bit of diligence and there are certain issues that come up that can sometimes make that requirement a little tricky. An UPC does not have to meet that requirement and neither does the uh, OPCO underneath it. Uh, secondly, an UPC may be more attractive to foreign investors and tax-exempt investors than an investment in an MLP. The reason for that is uh, foreign investors who invest in partnerships, which is what an MLP is for tax purposes, generally have income from, uh, uh, a, or deemed to have income from conduct of a U.S. trade or business or effectively connected income. In addition, when they sell their units or stock in the MLP, they're going to pay tax under the FERPTA rules typically, and they'll have to file U.S. tax returns reporting the uh, effectively connected income and FERPTA gain. A foreign investor who invests in a C corporation is not deemed to conduct a U.S. trade or business by virtue of that investment, does not have to file any U.S. tax returns and really doesn't pay any direct tax. Instead, the C corporation just withholds taxes from the dividends, and occasionally that's at a pretty favorable rate if the, uh, if the foreign investor is a uh, resident of a treaty country with which the uh, U.S. has a treaty. Similarly, tax-exempt investors who invest in MLPs have to report the income they receive from the MLP as uh, unrelated business uh, business taxable income. That requires a tax-exempt investor to pay tax and file a tax return with respect to that income. By contrast, if the uh, tax-exempt investor invests in the uh, PUBCO in our UPC structure, the dividends paid to that tax-exempt investor are generally not taxable at all to the tax-exempt investor. Uh, finally, retail investors um, may find an UPC structure, or in particular an investment in PUBCO in the UPC structure, more attractive than investing in an MLP because of the uh, complex K-1 reporting that MLPs entail. Uh, the PUBCO 
by contrast, would simply issue a 1099 reporting dividend income, and that's all a retail investor would have to uh, report. Um, you know, one, to, to be fair and balanced, you know, one thing an UPC does not do that an MLP does do is an MLP is always going to have a, a larger tax shield. And the reason for that is every time MLP units are traded or, or sold on the market, the uh, buyers, there's effective regeneration of asset tax basis. The asset tax basis that the buyer gets in its share of the MLP's assets is always going to be stepped up to reflect the purchase price that the uh, buyer of the MLP units paid. Uh, that, that isn't the case in an UPC structure. So we'll just pause here for a second um, to give you the CLE code. Again, attorneys participating via webinar have to note this number on their affirmation form to earn the appropriate CLE credits. The number is 23329. Again, that number is 23329. So, as we, as we mentioned at the beginning, PubCo has no assets or operations outside of its own ownership interest in Opco. Uh, Opco is, is, is the sole cash generation. Um, as a practical matter, this means that PubCo can't, uh, sorry, PubCo can't own any assets other than, than Opco. And so what that means is we need to have a one-to-one -one ex exchange ratio um, between where the number of, of uh, Class A and Class B shares put together equals the number of units to, that are in OPCO. And that, that can raise some practical issues. Um, one of those is that we need to have OPCO make distributions to PubCo in amounts that are sufficient to ensure that PubCo can make the, uh, can make the payments, uh, can pay its actual tax liabilities and can pay its TRA obligations. If OPCO were, or if you were in a, in a true, in a true or a, a fully private company, you, you might vary the distributions to one, to one class or another, but, but that would present problems in this structure um, where we have, we have to keep that coming, uh, or where you need to have that payment being the same to each OPCO on, on each OPCO unit. Um, also, uh, OPCO, or there are costs associated with being a public company. There's legal and accounting, you have SEC compliance, um, board compensation costs, uh, and other costs. Those are, those are all, those are all PubCO costs, but again, the only, the only source of cash is OPCO, and so OPCO is going to need to be on the hook for, for those those charges so that, that, that the PubCo economic shareholders, the, the public shareholders, aren't, aren't, aren't subsidizing the operation. Um, you also need to have any borrowings occurring either at the OPCO level or if you, you're doing your borrowing at the PubCo level, providing some mirror, mirror borrowings by OPCO from the PubCo. Um, you would need similar mirroring arrangements in place if you did any preferred equity issuances. Um, you know, I guess a point about the, those, the, the, those distributions, you know, part, of, part of making the equal distributions on, on all unit holders rather than, uh, rather than just making, making distributions as needed and truing it up is, is you don't want to have a setup where that that unequal payment could be considered a loan to, to the founders who are your insiders and you're potentially running into a Sarbanes-Oxley problem there. I think uh, on the prior slide, you know, so, some of those issues, the, those issues primarily dealt with the fact that uh, Pubco's only source of cash really is, is from Opco, therefore doesn't have the cash to pay its own expenses or taxes with unless it either gets the cash from PubCo or, or, or from OPCO, or OPCO actually pays the expense. Um, some of these issues on, on this slide really have to do with uh, things that are similar to the mirror arrangements that AJ described for the, uh, if there's debt or preferred stock. 
if uh, PubCo is going to issue stock options or, or have restricted stock subject to vesting that it's going to offer to uh, employees, we're going to have to have similar types of equity interests that PubCo owns at OPCO. In, in particular, any time a PubCo stock option is exercised and PubCo issues stock, PubCo in turn is going to have to take the uh, exercise price and have the ability to acquire from OPCO an equivalent number of OPCO units. Uh, similarly, if uh, PubCo is going to issue restricted stocks subject to vesting, PubCo is going to need to receive from OPCO uh, units that are also subject to vesting, and if that restricted stock is forfeited, PubCo's units and OPCO also have to be forfeited. And that's all needed to preserve the one-for-one -one exchange ratio. Um, another issue that sometimes comes up is uh, occasionally, PubCo will find itself with excess cash. The most common reason for that to occur is um, uh, OPCO's partnership agreement or LLC agreement will typically provide for tax distributions. As AJ mentioned previously, those usually need to be pro rata as to PubCo and all the other unit holders in OPCO. If other unit holders in OPCO are uh, private equity funds that have individuals ultimately as their partners, their tax rate's going to be a little bit higher, so the tax distribution provision may end up resulting in PubCo receiving more cash than what it really needs to pay its taxes with. When that happens, we, we need to figure out how to move that cash out of PubCo because in order to preserve a one-for-one -one exchange ratio or value ratio, between a PubCo Class A share and an OPCO unit. PubCo can't own any assets other than its OPCO units, and that includes excess cash. There's kind of two ways to deal with that. The, the uh, le less common way is to have PubCo simply declare a dividend to distribute the cash to its shareholders. That may be subject to credit agreement restrictions. Uh, more likely, it's a case that uh, PubCo really doesn't want to make a dividend distribution, but would rather use the cash in the OPCO business. In that case, PubCo would contribute the cash to OPCO for additional OPCO units. That, that sounds pretty simple, and it, by itself it is, but there's an additional step that has to happen to preserve the one-for-one -one relationship between outstanding PubCo Class A shares and OPCO units held by PubCo. That additional step is, is that uh, PubCo is going to have to issue a number of additional Class A shares equal to the number of OPCO units that PubCo acquired when it contributed the excess cash. The uh, typical way to do that is to have PubCo simply declare a stock dividend on its existing Class A shares. A couple other points to note, um, moving into an up-C structure really only works if your existing operating entity is a partnership or an LLC for tax purposes. If we have a privately held C corporation, we really can't effectively uh, uh, cause that to uh, become part of an up-C structure in an IPO. The reason for that is we, we can't really convert a C corporation on a tax efficient basis into a partnership or LLC because that conversion is essentially deemed to be a taxable sale by the C corporation of all of its assets, followed by a liquidating distribution to the shareholders of the uh, corporation, which generates both entity level tax and shareholder level tax. Uh, accordingly, I think the takeaway there is if you have a privately held entity that's an LP or an LLC that you think might be an UPC structure candidate in the future, you want to avoid converting that entity into a corporation. And I think the most obvious situation where we see that happen is uh, if you're taking on venture capital money, a lot of times venture capital investors will request that partnerships or LLCs convert into corporations before they invest. So that, that's something to watch out for and to avoid if you think you might want to uh, be in an UPC structure. A, a few you know, things also to look out for in an UPC structure. 
they obviously are more complex. As AJ noted, uh, the additional complexity doesn't really seem to be an impediment to marketing the stock or attracting investors anymore. Uh, it may make dealings with lenders and landlords, though, a bit more difficult as a practical matter. The uh, structure does uh, substantially increase compliance costs, as, as you might expect, given its complexity. Also, if you're going to have a tax receivable agreement, the uh, accounting costs for that can be pretty substantial. Yeah, I think for that reason, you just you tend not to see IPOs or smaller IPOs using the structure because it's probably just not worth the headache for a small benefit. Um, but you know, most, if you look at the list of companies that have, that have that have gone this route, they tend to be pretty pretty healthy sized IPOs. Yeah, that, that's a good point, AJ. That another similar point is on the TRA because it is complex. If you're in a business that uh, otherwise really kind of generates a lot of losses, and you know, an oil and gas uh, E and P company that's engaged in a lot of drilling generally isn't going to pay taxes anyway. They're going to be drilling, expending uh, drilling costs, which they then deduct. As a result any tax benefit that it gets from a basis step up on a TRA sometimes is pushed out, you know, 10, 20 or more years so that there, there really isn't much of a, in, any payments under a tax receivable agreement for many, many years. The, uh, <clears throat> one, one final point, uh, and we, we kind of discussed this earlier, um, OPCO will need to provide tax distributions. Uh, certainly, you know, the main reason is PubCo needs to get money from OPCO so that it can pay its uh, taxes and, and obligations under the tax receivable agreement. Uh, typically, though, sponsors and founders will insist that OPCO make tax distributions so that they receive sufficient funds to pay their taxes with. As I mentioned previously, it's often the case that the sponsors and founders are subject to the higher tax rates applicable to individuals than the tax rate that PubCo is subject to, which is a corporate tax rate. And, you know, right now the discrepancy can be really as high as 8.4 percent when you take into account uh, uh, Medicare taxes or self-employment taxes, in, in particular, 43 plus percent for an individual or 35 versus 35 percent for a corporation like PubCo. Um, I mentioned previously that that can result in PubCo ending up with a lot of excess cash. Um, you cannot, as AJ mentioned, simply distribute more to those OPCO uh, shareholders that are individuals, i.e. the sponsors and founders. You also can't really treat that as some sort of loan or advance. As a result, PubCo really has to get the higher tax distribution sponsors and founders are going to get a higher tax distribution. That can have an adverse effect of pretty significant cash drain on OPCO's business if you have a tax distribution provision that covers not only the individual federal tax rate, but uh, rates in states like California or New York that have very high rates. You can end up pushing out 50% or more of OPCO's cash. Um, as we as we come to a conclusion, uh, towards the conclusion, I just wanted to read the CLE code for you a again, in case you didn't catch that earlier. Um, the the code for your affirmation form is two three three two nine, and then you will also receive a, a copy of this presentation uh, by email in, in the next week. Um, the email address again, if you if you have questions um, or if you need a copy of the affirmation form sent to you again, is Marissa McDonald, M A R I S S A dot McDonald M C D O N A L D at BakerBots dot com, um, and we can we can respond to any questions that you might have uh, via email. Um, this last slide is, is fairly technical. Um, I, don't know if we, I think, in the interest of time, we'll, we'll we'll just leave this for the for the written materials that are that are sent out to you. Um, again, thank you all for for 
for participating in this webinar today. We, we've, we've enjoyed uh, enjoyed sharing with you, and, and if you have if you do have questions, uh, please reach out to any of us or send questions through through Marissa. Thank you so much.